Well, this week, as you know, we celebrate. But we never know what the future holds. I was standing literally right here. And it was probably six weeks ago. And I knew all of you would be looking at me wondering why I got a nasty bruise on the upper right-hand side of my face. So to make sure you wouldn't worry about that the entire sermon, I drew attention to it and told you what happened to me the day before. It wasn't like I was doing anything dangerous. It wasn't even like I was participating in activity that I've never done before. But in this weird, freakish chain of events, somehow I was too highly positioned on my bodyboard. The wave was a large rogue wave. That's what you're looking for when you're bodyboarding. As the wave hit me, The chain of events happened where all the water that was outgoing into the ocean had all disappeared. There was nothing but beach there. And as I went over the top of my bodyboard, the force of that wave drove my head with 230 pounds behind it right into the sand, the hard ocean floor. And it was pretty much over before I ever even knew what happened to me. The physical therapy I've been getting has been helping tremendously. But I've now confirmed with two doctors that they said that what happened to you that day and the way you came down directly on your head from at least four feet up in the air with the force of the wave driving you down, with the body weight behind you, pile driving you into that sand, you easily could have been paralyzed. I'm just out in the ocean. It's an August evening. I'm having fun with my son playing at the beach. And I could have been carried off in a body board and spending the rest of my life in a wheelchair. You experience something like that, ladies and gentlemen, and it really gives you a new perspective on life. That it just wasn't my time yet. Celebrations are no different. We don't know what the future holds. We love to celebrate birthday parties, but not to be too grim. This birthday party you're celebrating could be your last. We love to celebrate graduations, but who knows how that college degree will ever pay out for you in the future. We love to celebrate weddings, but who knows what trials you will face in the future as a married couple. We just simply do not know what the future holds. We are here now celebrating this week 75 years of God's faithfulness to Grace Bible Church. We had an excellent celebration last night. It was beautiful. In many ways, though, we don't know what the future holds for Grace Bible Church. But in many ways, we do know what the future holds for Grace Bible Church. And what I'd like to do this morning is examine the tension between those two thoughts as we see it in Scripture, chapter 1, Philippians, verses 19 to 26. If you're taking certain notes today, all three sermon points relate to the one main key word, which is hope. Hope in the future, hope from the past, and hope in the present. And it's all thanks, again, our theme this weekend, the hope we enjoy from the past, the present, and the future. It's all centered in the theme this weekend, which is the faithfulness of our God. So let's begin with the first point future hope in Jesus. Look at verse 19 with me. For I know, Paul says, that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, most people, when they interpret this verse, take it in what logically seems most appropriate. We know that Paul was incarcerated when he wrote this letter, And when he talks about deliverance, what we're naturally assuming is that he will be delivered from a Roman prison cell. But if we go with that interpretation that many pastors often do, the rest of this will make no sense. And even Paul, when he considers all the options that are out there, he's even saying, I don't know what's going to happen. And of all the options, I don't even know what's best. So what is he being delivered from? What's, what deliverance is he looking forward to? I mean, it could be I'll be delivered before my trial. Maybe I'll be delivered after my trial. 
Potentially, I won't be delivered at all. Uh, Potentially, I'll be found guilty at Caesar's tribunal, and I will be delivered to execution. So the question we have to ask right from the get-go in this section is, what is Paul so confident about that he will be delivered from when his situation seems so uncertain, so unknown? Delivered from what, Paul? Well, that Greek word that is used here, translated deliverance in the New American Standard Version, could also be translated salvation. Paul is confident as he's writing this letter that he, listen, he will be delivered from eternal wrath. He will be saved from hell. He'd be delivered from facing an eternal holy God who must punish sin. Why is that? I'm going to take this a little bit out of context, but we see the answer at the end of verse 19. The only hope Paul has for deliverance from his sin, deliverance from the wrath of God, deliverance from hell, is the, verse 19, provision of Jesus Christ. You see, apart from Christ, we are all radically hopeless. There is no hope at all for us in the future. Everything in this sermon is going to be about hope for the Christian. But for the unbeliever, there is no hope in this life and definitely in the life to come. Because the very standard we have when we will face God as a righteous judge after we die or when Christ returns is the standard of God himself. His character, his attributes, his righteousness. And you all know that we don't do it right. And the things that are right, we don't do those at all sometimes. We will be found guilty. The Bible says that all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all hopeless without some kind of provision for our lives. The issue is not righteous deeds. Because we can never do enough righteous deeds. And even if we were able to do enough righteous deeds, even our most righteous deeds are still tainted with sin. The problem we have, and you know this, Christian, is it's our sin. God judges according to his law, according to his character, according to perfect righteousness, and we naturally fall short. We need someone to make a provision for our sin. And the only hope we have is the provision of Jesus Christ, that he would go to that cross, that he would take our sin upon himself, that he would be our substitute and receive the very judgment and wrath of God that we deserve, and that he would promise us the free gift of eternal life when we come to him by believing, by repenting from our sins and trusting Christ. That's the provision that God has given to all of us. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as Paul is sitting in that Roman cell, it was more kind of a house arrest, and he's facing all of these amazing uncertainties in his life. There is one thing he knows that despite his present questionable circumstances, he has, as he's saying in this verse, a hope, a hope of eternal deliverance. The very promise of the living God who cannot lie, which is the provision of Jesus Christ. I mean, consider Paul. Put yourself in his shoes. He's unlawfully arrested He's possibly going to be found guilty at his trial. He will potentially even be killed at Caesar's tribunal. But he knew that through Christ, he was perfectly vindicated in the heavenly court. And to Paul, that's all that mattered. Man's judgment meant nothing to him. He had his eye upon the ultimate judgment when we will all stand before a living God. And he's saying, in that court, I've been vindicated thanks to the provision of Jesus Christ. And believer, I think you all know this. This is 101 Christianity here. But we can't get that out of our mind. We need to be reminded on that. We need to be 
more thankful for that, that you deserve hell. I deserve hell. But thanks to God's goodness, mercy, and grace, He has provided provision for us in Christ. And regardless of our circumstances, as long as I know that, I'm going to be okay. Some people believe that Paul in verse 19 is actually loosely quoting the book of Job. When Job said, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. For the unbeliever, there is no hope. If you do not trust Jesus Christ... I'm not trying to be bad guy and rain on your parade. This is an exciting week we're sharing. But the most loving thing I can tell you right now is you have no hope. But you came here by the sovereign grace of God to hear this message to say, if you trust Christ right now, you have hope right now. Your salvation is all through the work of Jesus Christ. That is God's promise. And as I said, God cannot lie. Let's go to the second point. Hope from, I'm going to call it from, past hope from Revelation. Here we go. Give you more hope. You want more hope? I got the future hope. How do I have present hope based upon past Revelation? Beginning now the second half of verse 19, Paul says this, that through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation hope that I will not be put to shame in anything. God's past revelation, that's why we read our Bible. This is all past revelation. This is how God speaks to us through his word. This is what gives us hope today based upon, it's not visions we receive today. It's not talking to God today and him revealing new things to me. It's not dreams. The hope I have today is based upon what he has revealed to me in the past. And that gives me a present hope. But what we must do if we interpret this verse rightly is we must understand the overall context of Philippians chapter 1. What is the goodness that we have in our present time? Look at verse 5. See if you can catch the theme here. Paul had gratitude for the Philippians' participation in what? The gospel. Verse 6 confidence that God, because of his gospel promises, will continue the work that he began in us. He's not going to abandon us ever. Verse 7, assurance that believers, because of the gospel, are partakers of grace. Due to God's delivered revelation, all Christians have hope that God will always work in us for good. What kind of good? Well, according to this section in Scripture, it's gospel good. That's how God is working in us. The good is not a bigger house or a boat or potentially having children or being married or whatever the case might be. The good that God promises to work in us, Romans 28, is gospel goodness that we would show and speak Jesus Christ. Remember Paul's goal in all things, verse 12. Greater progress of the gospel, I quote it directly. Paul rejoicing in verses 12 to 14. Paul, you're in jail. That's terrible. No, don't worry about it. It's got greater gospel purposes. But because I'm here, people that are in the Roman high offices never would have had an opportunity to hear the gospel if I was never incarcerated. And because of my imprisonment, even the believers have more boldness to share the gospel. Well, Paul, how do you feel about those guys in uh, verses 15 to 18 who are going out and sharing the gospel, trying to bring you pain, sharing Jesus based upon false motives? And what does Paul say? If they're sharing the truth and it's an accurate gospel presentation, my life doesn't matter. My, My life's not important to me. The gospel's going out. And in that, I'll rejoice. Man, how can you have this kind of confidence? Again, it's based upon God's delivered revelation in the Scripture. Hope in what we call His faithful providence, that He is always leading us 
to the ultimate goodness of gospel-centered living. If your eyes are not on Christ at all times, you'll only see the bad. And if your definition of good is different than God's definition of good, you won't be satisfied. Paul is a missionary, folks. He's commissioned by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles, probably the greatest missionary second to Jesus that ever lived. And Paul puts him in jail, or God puts him in jail now for at least the third time. You have to wonder, God, why would you, if I'm to be out on the road sharing the gospel with the lost, why you'd put me behind bars? That makes no sense. I'm confused. I'm perplexed. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. I'm mad at you. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. God is wiser than me, and God has good purposes for what he does and his good purposes for me are gospel centered and i sometimes can't figure it all out but i'm i'm here for a reason and therefore i don't know what's going on i don't know what the future holds maybe that's your life right now but i know when it's all said and done i'm going to be on the winning side because god doesn't make mistakes that's providence you know, we're studying the book of Ruth. Uh, we did actually last week at ACA. We're doing a, a survey of the Old Testament. And what I love about the book of Ruth so much is that it's only four chapters long, and God is hardly ever even mentioned, right? You got a, at least one verse. That might be it, right? Where, where Ruth goes, wherever you go, I'll go, and your people are my people, your God is my God. Even the narrator doesn't ever once mention God. There's nothing miraculous that takes place in the book of Ruth. Nothing miraculous. But it's all about God's providence. Not God's providence unfolding in one day as we often like to see it happen. But over years, that Ruth's in the place where God wants her and then Ruth is in the field where God wants her and Ruth meets the man that God wants her to meet and then that man does what God wants him to do and when it's all said and done, it's this happy ending. But at the time, it was pain, it was agony. And that's how God works in our lives as well. Always leading us to his ultimate goodness. His ultimate gospel-centered goodness. Look at verse 20. He says, I won't be put to shame in anything. Why? Because I know, verse 20, that God has provided me everything I need. And look at what he mentions. This is so beautiful. The prayers of the people. He's not saying... Um, I won't be put to shame because God's going to release me right now. He's not saying God's going to, um, I'm not going to put to shame because a lightning bolt is going to strike this prisoner uh, guard dead and the doors will open and I will escape through this miraculous event. No, I know that God has a plan, but, it, but he uses in co- cooperation with this sovereign plan the prayers of the church. That is beautiful. People say, well, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, why bother praying? Why bother evangelizing? Well, Paul believed in the sovereignty of God, clearly. And the first thing he says is, people have been praying for me. And that's been something that has characterized this church, I know, ever since I've been here, and I'm sure long before I arrived, that this church is a praying church. You guys pray for this church. As we gather together on Wednesday nights, I don't think, I don't know any church anywhere that does a Wednesday night prayer. I can't name one that does a Wednesday night prayer meeting. I cannot name a single church anywhere. We're doing it. And it was here when I got here, and it's still going strong 21 years later. You have other things you could be doing on Wednesday nights. You worked all day, you're tired. You haven't had dinner yet. You got to schlep your kids from school to soccer practice. You got homework you need to do with your children. You got to get ready for the next day tomorrow. It's hard to come back on a Wednesday night. But yet we see so many people here praying or, or working with our children or our youth group Wednesday nights. You know, people ask me, they're like, what would you say, Randy? I get this. Is the success of Grace Bible Church? And not in any way to disparage any other local church in the area, but, but there's no doubt, no one can deny that God has significantly blessed this church. There's no doubt about it. So you have to ask, why us and not the church down the road? Why? And, and, and I don't have an answer to that, but the only answer I can kind of maybe pull out of the thin air would be the church is committed to praying. 
And it's not like we have a prayer meeting and all of a sudden next Sunday, 45 new people get saved. It's just this slow growth. That's what we've had here at Grace. Slow growth. One person here, two people here, one person leaves. Three more people come, one might leave. And it's what we see now looking right before my very eyes. God providentially working through prayer to accomplish gospel-centered purposes. He knows also, look at verse 20, that God's given him another provision, and that is the Holy Spirit that gives him wisdom in knowing what to say. Boldness in saying the things he needs to say, even if he might get killed in the process for speaking those things. And this brother can sit back in a situation worse than any of us are experiencing and say, it's okay. It's okay. Because God is sovereign. God is good. God is wise. God is loving. And therefore, if he's working things together for good, and I can truly believe those attributes, what am I worried about? Everything's going according to plan. Paul, aren't you going to be embarrassed? No. How can I be embarrassed? You're in jail. You're a Christian. Well, well God put me here. Oh, well, isn't God going to be embarrassed? Well, well, he put me here. He knows what he's doing. Verse 20, there'd be no shame for me or God in anything, he says. But it is my, verse 20, earnest expectation and hope in the promises of God that everything, which I don't know how it's going to turn out, will be okay. It will be okay. And that's, you know, in the years of counseling, you know, when I first came out, it's like I, you come to me with these issues, and I'm, I'm trying to be like, you know, the clairvoyant almost. Like, well, here's what God is potentially doing in your life. I have no, I've learned to say more than ever now, I don't know. I have no idea. And people come to me, uh, this happened. I'm like, well, maybe that's why God did it, but I could probably give you 4,000 other things as to how God could be working in that situation too. You don't know. The only thing you can do is trust. Trust the promises of God in Scripture, as I said, that he's in control. Well, just because he controlled, that doesn't mean it's going to be good. What if he's a bad God who's in control? No, no, he's a good, loving God that's in control. Well, what if he's a good, loving God in control, but he makes bad decisions? He's just not smart. Well, no, he's a wise God. So if he's sovereign and he's wise and he's good and he's loving and all things are promised, 828 of Romans, to work together for your good, uh, and I'm preaching to myself here, what are you so worried about? Is God lying? Does God not care? Oh, of course. He cares about it more than anybody else does. Did he make a mistake? No, he's wiser than all of us. Well, you know, he just can't do anything about it. You know, free will, the devil overpowering. No, he's sovereign. He's all-powerful. Do you see the attitude? Hope in a faithful God regardless of my circumstances. We got to be careful, folks, that we don't think like an unbeliever. Just because things are going well does not mean you're blessed. And just because something goes bad does not mean you're not blessed. It's like the attitude I have, like I, I miss my devotional that day and I feel like it's going to be a bad day, right? And then you do a great devotional in the morning and, and God's going to bless me this day. And wow, it wasn't a good day. What happened? Maybe I had to read a little bit longer the next day. We don't understand grace. We're basing our love for God and God's love for us on our works. You remember in Acts chapter 16, we talked about it probably two months ago, that it describes Paul's first trip to Philippi, the town that he wrote this letter to. He had nowhere to go. He's landlocked at the Aegean Sea, a town called Troas. He gets the vision, come over and help us, crosses into modern-day Europe. It was Macedonia, one of the two districts of Greece, and he's in Philippi. And the, the, God calls him there, and the moment he gets there, he preaches the gospel. Good things are happening by strange people you never expect. Who is God saving? He saves this, this Gentile woman named Lydia. And then he saves probably this slave girl. And then he saves a Roman prison guard and his family. And you're like, like just, it's not how you would have scripted things. But what happens to Paul? Well, the folks didn't like it very much that he cast a demon out of a slave girl. And that lost all the proceeds and the profits that they were making from, in a sense, proselytizing this poor girl. 
Paul gets thrown in jail. They beat him with rods. They stretch out his feet. They place it in the stocks. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's what you get for being faithful to God? You know, he wrote to the Thessalonian church. The, the church in Thessalonica was the next church that he visited as he kind of went counterclockwise around the horn of Macedonia there. And in his first letter to the Thessalonians, he wrote this. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, they knew Philippi. That's like saying to us after I got mistreated in Howell. You knew we suffered and were mistreated in Philippi. But listen to the perspective as the verse continues. As you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel amid much opposition. God will use your circumstances according to his sovereign providence, according to his good pleasure to accomplish the ultimate goal, which Paul says here, is the exaltation of Jesus Christ. I want you to ask yourself, can it get any better than that? Because if you put anything in the blank, you're in big trouble. What is it, the exaltation of yourself? What do you want more than anything else? The exaltation of Christ. And that's all that mattered to Paul. That's all we see here. That's all that mattered to him. The exaltation of Jesus Christ. It's getting to the point, brothers and sisters, when the glory of God means more to you than anything in the world. That's what it means to be a Christian. And we accept that lot that's been given to us by the Lord, knowing that he always intends good for our lives. We can have contentment then regarding our circumstances, something Paul's going to talk about in chapter 4 of Philippians. We can have no anxiety in our lives, something Paul will talk about in chapter 4 of Philippians as well. Nothing ever matters, Paul's saying. Paul, that matters, Paul is saying, is that Christ is exalted in my body. It's not about my health. It's not about my wealth. It's not about my comfort or my prosperity. It's not about any of those things. All that matters is Christ is exalted in my body, even if I live or even through the means by which I must, might be killed. Wow. Remember a few weeks ago we were talking about discernment. And um, discernment is not so much the ability to tell the difference between what is good and what is bad. That, that's, just, that's just baby Christianity. Good, bad, right? We gave you the examples, you know. Good. Flat surface, little baby. Bad stairs, baby. Stairs bad. You can get hurt. Good flat surface. You're safe. That's baby Christianity. Church, good to go to church. Staying away from church, bad. I mean, that's just like basics. Discernment is telling the difference between what is good and what is excellent, though. What is good and what is excellent. Remember that we talked about that. The more we come to know with our minds the love of God, because God is love, obviously everything God does is good and loving. The more we understand the love of God, the more we will be discerning because we'll understand to love the things that he loves and to hate the things that he hates. We've been faced, um, as you know, here at Grace Bible Church with many financial needs. Our budget each year is over a million dollars now. Um, I don't know about the past, but since I came in 2001, we've never had a need not met financially. Never. As a matter of fact, we've always had a surplus. We've had detailed, prayer-filled elder meetings recently to say we have a hundred grand sitting in the bank account over and above our emergency fund. What do we do with it because God doesn't want it sitting in a bank account? That's a good problem to have, folks. Well, I got to tell you, the money didn't fall from the sky. We didn't pick it off trees. Where did it come from? You. When you put money in that collection plate, you had a decision to make. 
Because that money could have got you a lot of good things. It could have beefed up your retirement. You could have said, man, inflation, what is it, 8% now? We need some extra money now so we don't lose more money. We love to get a boat. We love to put an addition on the house. We love to have some money we can help our children when we send them off to college. Each week, you guys are making a decision and saying, you know what, I could go out to dinner this week with that money with my spouse, and I'm going to choose to not go out to dinner We're going to eat leftovers at home, and we're going to give that money to the church. You've made those decisions. That's that's good to excellent. You choose what is excellent because you're saying, what matters most in my life? The exaltation of Christ. And I want this money to go to the exaltation of Christ. What matters most in my life? Not my treasures here on earth, but my treasures in heaven. You see, that's discernment. When we had the building project going on, and we're like, we want to build a new building. (laughs) It's going to cost millions of dollars. And the church was like, the first eight rows right here. That's all we had. (laughs) That's it. And we said, we're going to do a building fund. And I preached, I preached six messages on what God says about finances. Six messages you got from me. A month and a half, you got messages on what God says about money. A month and a half. And Russ, he's here somewhere. Where are you at, Russ? Oh, right in front of me here. Yeah. Um, you remember that day, the Reveal Sunday, we called it, right? Or Reveal, Celebration Sunday, Reveal Sunday. I'm at, and I got up there. Who was here that day? Raise your hand. All right. About, about 25% of you, yeah. And we didn't even have a, a screen at the church, I don't think. Um, but we had the, the wood frame above the baptistry, right? That was about maybe a foot and a half. And I was going to say at the end of the service, and now here's what we got. Remember that? And you were up in the, um, the uh, upstairs area. You were on there, your little projector there. And when I say here's what we got, you were going to broadcast the amount that came in because no one knew. No one knew yet, right? No one knew. And I said, and here's what we got. And I don't know if you just uh, couldn't find the uh, advance button or you wanted to make it more dramatic, but you waited a little bit, didn't you? <laughs> and it seemed like, remember that day? It's like hours of rust. Put it up there. <laughs> $1.1 million. You say, who helped you guys with that one? Zero people. You say, you, we were writing letters to Albert Pujols. Kurt Cameron, I mean, we're writing letters to everybody we could think of that had money as a Christian. I was calling wealthy Christian businessmen. We got zero money from outside. That was raised by like 20% of the people that are sitting right here in this church. 1.1. Now, don't tell me people didn't make sacrifices. Apart from the sacrifice, we wouldn't be here. This building cost $3.8 million. Then we did a second campaign. Start chipping away at that debt. And as you know, four or five years ago, we paid off our debt. And we are debt-free in a building that is appraised recently, I think, at $6.9 million. That is the grace of God, and we praise God for that. But it didn't happen just because God did miracles. It happened because people made sacrifices through discernment to tell what is good and what is excellent. Paul's goal, exalt Christ. But right now, on his mind, he is facing death. Or he knows that he might live. And this, for him, is his dilemma. Because living for Christ is good. Dying to be with Christ is good, too. But Paul's trying to discern. He's having this this imagination game going on in his mind, like, well, dying is good, Living is good, but which one's excellent? I like them both. As a Christian, I'm happy here, I'm happy there. It's win, win. Which one's excellent? And he says, well, first blush, initial reaction, look at verse 21. For me, to live is Christ. But to die is what? Gain. Let's go to the last point. Present hope in living. Here we go. In his own mind now, Paul takes a step back, and he says, let me put a little bit more thought into this one. Let me, let me really consider the two alternatives that hang in the balance. Um, if I'm asked, 
Would you rather live or rather die? Um, how does that affect me? How does that affect the glory of God? And how does that affect this Philippian church? Well, to live, it means furthering the gospel. To die, it means direct presence with the Savior. And I have, Paul says, great tension in these two choices. Look at the end of verse 22. I do not know which to choose. I don't know which to choose. Look at the beginning of verse 23. I'm hard-pressed from both directions because if I die, verse 23, that is clearly my desire to depart and be with Christ. That's my desire. My desire is to just go meet Jesus. And I could second that myself as good as my life is right now. You ask me what I want, what's best for me, take me out of this world. And if you really love the world, just put on the evening news for like 20 minutes and you'll feel the same way. I just want to go be in a place where righteousness reigns and to see my Savior face to face. It's clearly gain, as Paul says in verse 21. I love Jesus more than my life. And compared to the things here on earth, I'd rather be in his direct presence for all of eternity. And I'd like to see to eternity start in that sense today. And therefore, I confess in verse 23 that such a prospect is very much better. We call that a, a double comparative in how he structured this in the Greek. It's using multiple words that say the same thing to build emphasis, almost like if I were to say, this is the absolute best over and above pizza that I've ever enjoyed in my life. Paul saying, I know what my intentions are. My intentions are to be with Jesus. And he told us that in 2 Corinthians 5.8, um, I prefer rather to be absent from the body and home with the Lord. He's saying, you want my desire? I hope they kill me. I hope they kill me so I can go be with Jesus because my death is the portal into eternal life with him. Yet Paul knows that if he lives, verse 23, other alternative, it will mean fruitful labor for me. Fruitful labor. You know, we're here celebrating 75 years and we look back at the faithful men and women, most of them we don't even know over the decades that went before us. They were engaged in fruitful ministry. They sowed a lot of gospel seeds, and in many ways, we are reaping the fruit that they never got to enjoy. All the people that went before us, we are here today because of the faithfulness of them, their faithfulness in giving, their faithfulness in making sacrifices, their faithfulness in sharing the gospel, having a desire to plant a church in South Belmar, to build the building there. That was all their faithfulness that went before us, and we are reaping the fruit. And Paul is saying, if I continue gospel ministry here on earth, I keep reaping more fruit in planting churches, in training up leaders in the churches, in, in equipping the saints of the churches. And therefore I know, verse 24, that because of this, I think it's more important for you to remain on the flesh. You see, what he's doing is he's giving a foretaste of chapter 2, verse 4, when he says, consider other people more important than yourself. Gospel-centered. My service to Christ, he's saying, is more important than my own personal preferences. If you ask me, I want to go be with Jesus. Lord, come quickly or take my life. But when I think about it and I put other people ahead of me, I look at the current state of the Philippian church and other churches in the Mediterranean region, and I think personally that it's probably better for me to stick around for a few more years. And with that thought, I believe that's what God's going to do, and God did do that. Heaven is postponed because there's more work for me to do here on earth. Verses 25 and 26 convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, gospel-centered, Christ-centered, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again, Christ-centered, gospel-centered. This is indeed a heavy passage in the book of Philippians. But it's one that is filled with tremendous hope. We have hope 
folks. We have hope that God will deliver us from his wrath. We will be saved. We have the promise of heaven with him for all of eternity. We have hope that God is working in our lives today for our ultimate good, the gospel-centered purposes that he has in us. And we have hope when it's a toss-up as to whether we stick around a little bit longer or he chooses to take us tomorrow, that God will make that decision for us and it will also be for our good and the glory of God. In the meantime, we serve Christ. Because this is where he has today. We are part of the legacy We are part of the Grace Bible Church family. We are alive in this generation, placed in this location by His providence to be used by Him to accomplish things that will outlive our earthly existence. We look back to the people that went before us with gratitude and appreciation, but we don't rest on that. We don't rest on all the work they did. It's our job now to get behind the plow and to faithfully sow gospel seeds and encourage one another and put the needs of each other above ourselves. And we have one eye on the future that says, I won't be around forever. That in 50 years from now, if God chooses not to come back, this is an entirely new church. And we ask ourselves, are we preparing this church for them? We paid off this building. We're improving the sanctuary. We have excellent ministries in place. We're discipling the young people. And we're training up future men in leadership to take the the baton when we move on. It's like my accident. We don't know what the future holds. But in many ways, we do. We know what the future holds in the things that are most important. And that's where our focus needs to be. So no matter how you slice it, with Jesus, we're always winners. We are more than conquerors because in him, we have true life now. And in him, we got a better life to come. And that, that gospel-centered, Christ-centered grace is why we as Christians can celebrate. Father, we love you. We thank you for the work that you've done in this church. May the love of Jesus Christ compel us to be the very people you want us to be. And I speak that, Lord, not as a rebuke, although potentially some people need to step it up. I speak that by way of encouragement because you had done a great work in this church. And the people in this church are committed to giving financially. The people in this church are committed to praying for this church. The the people in this church are committed to loving one another in this church. The people in this church are committed to serving, using their gifts as a good steward of their gifts and their time to build up the body of Christ. And Lord, through those tough times, people have come and people have gone. But the church still stands. In many ways, we outlive those that might be enemies of Grace Bible Church. The ministry continues to go on because you build your church. And our faith is not in the flimsy will of man, but in the never-changing, immutable will of God. You are in control. This is your world. This is the only institution, the church, that you ever promised to build It will not fail. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We are winners more than conquerors, and we know the outcome before the outcome has ever arrived. Help us to focus on the things that we can be guaranteed of, to trust you, Lord, for the daily events that affect our lives and through our circumstances to realize you are sovereign, and therefore we can have hope because you are faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen, amen, amen. amen.